So I'm going to get it out right now. My favorite professional hockey team, the Toronto Maple Leafs, lost in the seventh game of the playoffs last night, overtime. So it was 12.30 on a Saturday night, and I'm still watching hockey. So I need to find a sport where they play in the daytime, and then I won't be affected so much. But today we are going to look at Esther. And this is a woman who said yes to God in spite of the fear in her life. And today I'm going to try and do the impossible. We're going to go through all 10 chapters of the book of Esther in less than 30 minutes. And this is one of the most fascinating stories in the Bible. Because, and and I want you to make some applications as we go through this as well. So Esther's a unique book. Because it's one of only two books that were written in the name of a woman in the whole Bible. But the biggest distinction is that in this book, there is not one mention of the word God. God doesn't appear anywhere in the text. And you're thinking, oh, isn't this the word of God? Shouldn't we be reading God's name in this? But don't be fooled. While the name of God is isn't found, the hand of God is seen all throughout this, weaving in this story. Now, I'm going to introduce you to the five main characters, and the first character is Xerxes, and he's king over all Persia, and uh, the setting is Persia, it's 486 BC, and King Xerxes is preparing for a major battle. But he prepares for it in a strange way, by throwing a party. And this party has lasted for six months. And they're now concluding the celebration. And Xerxes starts thinking about his wife, uh, Queen Vashti, because he hasn't seen her in a while. And he is likely drunk, and he decides that he's going to show off his wife by... uh, bringing her before his buddies. But the story has an unexpected twist because she refuses to appear before him. She refuses to obey his order. And Queen Vashti, she has some convictions. She decides that she's not going to become a sex object to be ogled by her husband's drunken buddies. She wasn't about to become the closing act of this six-month party. And the result is the king is embarrassed, and when the king's embarrassed, he gets angry. And at this time, it's very much a man's world, and if a king can't make his wife behave, then how is he going to control a country? How is he going to control the military? So to save face with his cronies, he has Queen Vashti banished. Then look at Esther chapter 2 verses 2 to 4. So his personal attendants suggested, let us search the empire to find beautiful young virgins for the king. Let the king appoint agents in each province to bring these beautiful young women into the royal harem at the fortress of Susa. Haggai, the king's eunuch in charge of the harem, will see that they are all given beauty treatments. After that, The young woman who most pleases the king will be made queen instead of Vashti. And I love this next phrase. This advice was very appealing to the king. So he put the plan into effect. And it's no surprise that the vote was unanimous, that this beauty pageant was a great idea. And I'm sure that all the men in his group of advisors, they were volunteering to be judges at this beauty pageant. So the most beautiful women in the whole empire were brought to Susa. Now, Susa is what we now know as modern-day Iran. And they are all brought for this beauty pageant of all beauty pageants. And this is where we see that invisible finger of God start to move. And guess where it stops? It stops at this young woman by the name of Esther. Esther was a Jewish girl, and she was an orphan. She was probably somewhere around 18 years of age. But she continues to advance through round after round after round of this beauty pageant. She breezes through the talent section. She has no trouble at all with the swimsuit and the interview portions of this pageant. And then eventually, 
out of all these other young women representing 127 provinces in the country of Persia, she is chosen. She catches King Xerxes' eye and maybe even his heart. And Esther becomes the king's wife and she becomes queen of the country. Now, one of the greatest characters in this book is Mordecai. So let me tell you about Mordecai. Mordecai is an older cousin of Esther, and he actually took Esther into his home and raised her as his daughter when her parents died. And he also becomes a government official. He too is Jewish, but you need to know that there's a secondary storyline here, and it's kind of being interwoven throughout the book. And that is the fact that Mordecai was around the palace one day, and he overhears an assassination plot by two of the attendants, actually, for the king. So he intercedes, and he quickly relays the details to Esther, and Esther then tells the king, and the king's life is spared. The bad guys are put to death, and Mordecai's name is written down in the chronicles so that someday he will be honored for his efforts. But there's one more character that you need to meet, and this is Haman. Haman is conniving, he's underhanded, he's egotistical, and those are his good qualities. And, and this guy is Xerxes' number two man, and he's a deceiver. He, he loves the attention. He, he asks that everybody that comes in to the palace would bow down to him. He's not even talking about the king, but you bow down to me. And Mordecai's not going to do that. Because he's Jewish and Haman is an Amalekite and these two races of people are enemies of one another. And secondly, Mordecai was Jewish, as I also mentioned, but they stood in stark contrast to the rest of the world because the Jews believed in one true God. So they'll bow to God, but they won't bow to any other person or image. And don't miss this part. Mordecai's refusal to bow down sparks an outlandish response. And Haman, with his wounded ego, he comes up with this evil plan to get rid of Mordecai. But you can tell how angry he is. This plan goes beyond getting rid of Mordecai, but he is going to get rid of all the Jews in the country. So this is going to be an ancient holocaust throughout all of Persia. So Haman presents his devious plan, and in a weak moment, King Xerxes signs it into law. Now, Haman feels that he's going to get the last laugh here, and Mordecai hears the news, and, and he's afraid for the Jews. These are the chosen people through which our Savior would one day come. So you need to understand that when Esther came into the palace, Mordecai advised her to not tell anyone that she was Jewish because it could cause problems for her. So now here is Mordecai sending words to Esther. He says, you're going to have to do something. You're going to have to intervene here. And Esther's response is, that's easy enough to say, but not so easy to do. The king hasn't called me into his presence in a month now. And the insinuation is, She's afraid that the king has now found another woman and she has lost favor with him. And back then, the queen was more of a showpiece and she wasn't an equal partner whose opinions were valued. And Esther knows the law. If she goes to the king without being summoned and he doesn't invite her forward by extending his gold scepter, then she will be put to death. So here is Esther conveying her fears to Mordecai. And we see this in chapter 4. And this is the crux of the entire book. So Hathach gave Esther's message to Mordecai. Mordecai sent this reply to Esther. Don't think for a moment that because you're in the palace, you will escape when all other Jews are killed. If you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place, but you and your relatives will die. 
Who knows that perhaps you were made queen for just such a time as this. So Mordecai's challenging her. He's saying, Esther, it's time for you to take a stand for God and his people. And so now, from a distance, this cousin who raised her, who took her into his family, is lobbying Esther to overcome her fears and do the right thing for every Jewish man, woman, and child. And did you catch that last line? Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for just such a time as this. So Mordecai's pleading with this young woman that he raised and that he taught, to, and he wants her to say yes to God. He's saying, God, he's unfolding this plan before you right now. And if you are part of it, then you must have the courage to trust his plan and take a stand. And then in verse 15, then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go gather together all the Jews of Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will do the same. And then, though it is against the law, I will go in to see the king. If I must die, I must die. And so we think, wow, what a woman of God. Esther knows that on her own, she's inadequate. She's terrified. But through the prayers of fellow believers, she'll have the courage to do what's right. So she commits to fasting and to approach the king, even though it's against the law. And she says, if I must die, then I will die. So all the Jewish people pray and fast. And then on the fourth day, Esther begins her walk into the palace where King Xerxes is. And I just can't imagine what's going through her mind at this time. And then she must be feeling physically uh, emaciated as well. She hasn't eaten or had anything to drink for three days. And then she remembers how Queen Vashti was banished because she wouldn't come into the king's presence So what can happen to me if I come into the king's presence unannounced and uninvited? So she walks up to the throne, hopeful that he's going to extend that scepter and not his sword. So we pick up in chapter 5. When he saw Queen Esther standing there in the inner court, he welcomed her and held out the gold scepter to her. So Esther approached and touched the end of the scepter Then the king asked her, What do you want, Queen Esther? What is your request? I will give it to you, even if it is half the kingdom. And Esther replied, If it please the king, let the king and Haman come today to a banquet I have prepared for the king. So she did that. She had that banquet. They came to the banquet. And Xerxes asked her again what her request was. And she said, Come back tomorrow. We'll have another banquet, just the three of us. So then he added, but this is all, excuse me. So then we've got Haman coming into the scene again. And Haman, he he goes back home, and he's feeling pretty proud. His head is just swollen right now because he has had a private banquet with the king and the queen, and the queen has invited him back again tomorrow for the very same thing. And if I could be back there and give advice to Haman, stop bragging. Because every time something wonderful happens and I start bragging about it, something goes sideways on me. It's best just to be quiet. But then in verse 13 of chapter 5, he added, But this is all worth nothing as long as I see Mordecai the Jew just sitting there at the palace gate. So sensing his discouragement, his wife and his friends encourage him to build a set of gallows and to encourage the king to have Mordecai hung on those gallows. And Haman loved the idea and he embraces it. Now, there's been the odd time I've complained a little bit about struggles I've had with people and complained in front of my family, but they've never said, build the gallows, hang the guy. Never said anything like that. But that's what Haman's family and friends are telling him to do. So that same night back at the palace, King Xerxes, he can't sleep. He's probably wondering, 
what's she going to ask for? In a weak moment, I offered her up to half my kingdom. So he can't sleep. And when a king can't sleep, they've got all kinds of people that they can invite to help them sleep. So he calls in one of his aides, and he said, would you read to me from the, my uh, chronicles? And here is what the uh, guy actually reads from. He reads the section where Mordecai discovered the assassination plot against the king, and he came forward with that plan, and the king's life was saved. And then the servant said, this man was never honored for what he did. So the next morning, Xerxes decides that he's going to honor Mordecai by having him placed on his royal horse and paraded through town in order to honor him. And the irony is that Xerxes instructs Haman to actually lead this procession, to hold on to the bridle of the horse and walk through the town screaming, this is what is done for the man who honors the king. And it was just killing him to have to do that. But th this is justice that's taking place here. And while it had to be vindication for Mordecai, he's not celebrating too much because while this is his day, he was paraded through the city, he knows that in just a few hours, Esther is going to go before the king. And he knows that in just a few days, this order to have all the Jews killed will go into effect. So he is concerned about that, and any joy is short-lived because of that. And Haman, he can't pout for long after this embarrassing morning because he knows that in a few hours, he's getting invited to another banquet with just he, the king, and the queen. So this is a moment of truth for Esther. And the king asks at the banquet and says, what's your request? And here's Esther. She replied, I have found favor with the king. And if it pleases the king to grant my request, I ask that my life and the lives of my people will be spared. For my people and I have been sold to those who would kill, slaughter, and annihilate us. If we had merely been sold as slaves... I could remain quiet, for that would be too trivial a matter to warrant disturbing the king. Now remember, only Mordecai knows that she's uh, Jewish. Who would do such a thing, King Xerxes demanded? Who would be so presumptuous as to touch you? And Esther replied, This wicked Haman is our adversary and our enemy. And Haman grew pale with fright before the king and queen. And then the king jumped to his feet in a rage and went out into the palace garden. Haman, however, stayed behind to plead for his life with Queen Esther. And for he knew that the king intended to kill him. So a few minutes later, the king has calmed down just a little bit, and he comes back into the room. And just at that exact moment, Esther is reclining on the sofa, and Haman is falling onto the couch as he begs for her life. But again, God's timing is perfect, because when the Xerxes walks in from his vantage point, something uh, inappropriate is taking place. So the king exclaimed, will you even exalt the queen? excuse me, assault the queen right here in the palace before my very eyes? And I love what happens next. One of his servants comes up to him and, and he says, uh, excuse me, O king, but on my way to work today, I was walking past Haman's house and he has a set of gallows built there. And I spoke to some of his neighbors and they said he built those gallows because he is hoping that you, O king, would have Mordecai hung on those gallows. So this is a story that only God could have orchestrated. While the name God is never mentioned here at all in this 10 chapters, we can't miss his presence. So then we see King Xerxes reaching the boiling point, and he says, you go out, you take Haman, and you hang him there on those gallows instead. And that's what happened. Haman is hung by the noose that he'd made for himself.
So that's God involved in all of that. God using Esther, an orphan girl who had both inner beauty and outer beauty. And Xerxes chose her because of her beauty, but God chose her because of her character. And Esther faced her fears, and she willingly placed her life on the line for the Jewish people. And God used her courage as a vehicle. Now, I still have time left. That was a lot less than 30 minutes. I have three brief uh, applications to make to our own lives for when we are afraid. First of all, face your fears with others. Uh, Too many times we have this lone ranger mentality. Uh, Our tendency is to tough it out. Uh, We think we don't need the help of others. Uh, This is my problem, and I'll handle it. But in 1 Corinthians 12, we're told that we are in the church are part of a body, and we have different responsibilities, and we're to work together. Because in verse 26, Paul said, If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. The high school football team I played on, we were actually a really close group. And whenever somebody received honor for something, everybody else rejoiced with that person. There were three of us that played both the defensive line and offensive line. We never left the field. The other two, they were all-stars. I didn't quite make it. But the coach said, Greg, you're an all-star too. You should have been there. But they rejoiced. We shared that together. But whenever something negative happened to one of the team members, the others jumped in and shared that as well. And one rule we had was a no smoking rule. And if the coaches happened to see one of the teams smoking out behind the school or or one guy, he had a flat tire on the way home from school and decided that was an occasion to smoke a cigarette. And then the coach drove by. So he had to do the smoker's drill, which was horrible, all the running and different uh, activities. So the whole team says, we'll do it with you. We always did it together. And it made the team come together. As a church, we come together as well. And that team won the Lobster Bowl. Nothing more prestigious than the Lobster Bowl. Now in the church, When you share your fears with others, you're lightening the load as they'll help you carry the burden and face your fears. And this is one of the reasons behind our discipleship groups. They're not just designed so that we can grow in our faith and encourage one another in that way, but they are also designed so that we can carry one another's load, that we can work together through the problems that each of us are facing. And if you're not plugged into a group, I encourage you to do so. We have information at the Welcome Center. You can stop there on the way out or go to our website. There's all kinds kinds of information there. But we want this place to continue to transform into one that is filled with relationships, friendships, and people who walk beside one another, who when they're afraid, and we walk with people when they're going through those valleys in their lives. So don't put it off because those other people need you as well as you needing them. So learn a lesson from Esther. Notice how she pulls in some people to know of her fear and her weakness. She could have said, I'm just going to spend some quiet time praying to God on my own here. But instead she said, I'll get my servants and Mordecai, you get every Jewish person in Susa to fast and pray with me. So face your fears with others. And then the second thing to do is get spiritually prepared. See, when you have a big decision to make when you're facing some fear, don't do it in your own strength and power. Esther knew that she couldn't do this on her own, and that's why she enlisted the help of all those others in the country. And this was a big thing, and she expanded the way she approached it. She didn't just pray, she also fasted. And when a person fasts from eating physical food over a period of time, it is a time in which we then fill that time that we would be eating with prayer and communion with God. And our stomach might growl, there might be some hunger pains, but they serve as reminders that we just turn things over to God and talk to Him. 
So your relationship and love for the Lord deepens in that time, and it becomes an antidote to fear. The third application I want to make comes just after I read this scripture. So 1 John uh, chapter 4, verse 18. Such love has no fear, because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced this love. Now people will say, well, what about in the Bible where it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom? Uh, that's true. That we do fear God because of who he is, because of what he can do. But it is a, a recognition of his power. It's not a cowering before him. Most of you have never met my father. He was a powerful man, a farmer with hands, size 15, ring finger. Mine's a, a, a 10. And he was here helping us do our demolition when we renovated our building in 2011. And he actually died six months later with pancreatic cancer. So he was sick at the time he was here. So he was 78 years of age then. And he was knocking down walls, and these young, strong guys were saying, Greg, get your dad to slow down. He's going to have a heart attack. And then on the third day, Greg, get your dad to slow down. We can't keep up to him. But it's powerful. So I recognized that power. I loved my father. I had a healthy respect for who he was, but I did not want that hand on my bottom. So it... Affected my activity. Part of your spiritual preparation must be praying to God, reading His Word, and then relying on the godly counsel of others. Like Esther, you're expressing that in the flesh you can't overcome this fear, but with God's help you will be strong and courageous. So when Esther walked uninvited into the presence of the king, she did that because she was spiritually prepared. And then the last lesson is do God's will, no matter what. When Esther risks her life and makes her request, she's not being some melodramatic soap opera actress who's trying to manufacturing emotion, trying to get a response from her husband. But she is experiencing real emotions because the consequences are real. The potential for death is right there for her along with every other Jew. So no wonder she's fearful. Now, I don't know about you, but there's not a week that goes by when I'm not tempted to be afraid of something. It might be a financial concern. It could be a relationship concern. It could be something that one of you have as a concern, and I take that on as well. It could be just being intimidated by a certain individual. I want to share my faith with them, but afraid to do it. Following God's call will always be frightening because God will call you to do what you cannot do on your own. Write that down if you have a pen. But following God's call will always be frightening because God will call you to do something that you cannot do on your own. So remember what the Word of God tells us in Psalm 118. The Lord is for me, so I will have no fear. What can mere people do to me? And then Paul said this in 2 Timothy. He said, For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. So when we feel those fears coming on, I found that that's when God does his best work. And it's a strange paradox, because when I put my confidence in myself, I tend to be consumed with fear, and I fall. But when I put my confidence in God and in Jesus and say yes to his plan, he always shows up at just the right time. About four years into my ministry here, I was really struggling and living in fear and leading in fear. My first and only other ministry was a rural congregation and uh, I had only knew the country. Uh, my wife, Pat, and I lived in the city the first two years of our marriage, the big city of Charlottetown, 30,000 people, so not too much of a city. And when I came here, we were given the, uh, 
the word that we were to become self-supporting in two years. We had 15 people, and you've got to be self-supporting in two years. So God worked through what we did. We achieved that. But at the four-year point, I was having a real struggle with some of the leadership. And I, I was ready to just pack it all in. But I, I just sensed that God was saying, no, you, you stick with this. And uh, I did. And God has been there. He's been strengthening and leading this church all those years. So 21 years later, you're still stuck with me. It won't go on forever. Don't worry. But in, in spite of my fears, in spite of my inadequacies, God renewed my joy and removed my fears. And I've been having a lot of fun for a, a lot of years. Here's some really good news I want to share with you. When you approach the king of kings, do not be afraid. He will extend that golden scepter. He will welcome you into his presence because he longs to have a personal relationship with you. You probably have something that frightens you as well. And know this, that it's a journey, it's a process, but God will be there with you every step of the way. He's going to walk there right beside you. And remember Esther, she's important not because she grew up without parents, not because she was a beautiful Jewish girl, not because she was the queen of Persia. We remember Esther because she said yes to God even when she was afraid. So what has paralyzed you today? What's the fear that keeps you from accepting Jesus' message of salvation? What's the fear that keeps you from accepting the gospel? Is it maybe uh, the fact that you're afraid of commitment or, or maybe you're afraid of change or maybe you're afraid of being in front of crowds and, and making that verbal commitment? Remember Esther because she was the one that said yes and those words that God has put you in this place at just the right time.